last couple of months have been incredible. Uh, December 17, I was in Havana. We were having a conference with you and U.S. Relations. Conference on December 16 had ended in the last panel of the day in a very pessimistic note. Everybody was saying, but nothing is going to happen. There was this debate about uh, Alan Gross had to be freed in order to Obama move from Cuba and the Cubans were saying, well, Alan Gross cannot be freed if the Cuban three are not free. Well, the funny thing that something happened and that something was happening and our president had been talking that day and the next day we had this wonderful news. Among the many things that changed was the presentation I gave to the group <laughs> last year. Um, so I can remind you how I finished my presentation. I finished with this question and with this picture. Incredible. I was asking, is this the future? I was not sure if that was going to be the future. Now, as I see these two guys shaking hands in, at the end of 2013, at the funeral of Nelson Mandela in Johannesburg, and they didn't let anyone know at the time that they were already negotiating six months before. They should have been gotten Oscars last night. <laughs> and the other part, of course, is the long history. From 1804, after the Louisiana Purchase, Thomas Jefferson told James Madison, Cuba is the most important acquisition we can make. Because if you see the connection, it's obvious that Cuba is there in the connection between the Eastern Seaboard of the United States and the Gulf Ports. So that ambition to control Cuba has been there all the time. And then came the whole history of the Spanish-American War. You call it the Spanish-American War, we call it the Spanish-Cuban War. Because we were fighting the Spaniards before you came in. When you came in and the, the war lasted 121 days, we already had Spain on the road. At least that's how we see it. <laughs> <laughs> the tension is that the next time they go big. I was, I was struck by that. It was a great idea. A friend of mine told me, but it was not original for Bill and Peter. Actually, Machiavelli in the Prince recommends to the Prince that if he's going to do something, do it big and do it fast. So everybody is uh, taken by surprise. Some of the critics of President Obama have said that he, he gave up everything and got nothing in return. Well, that's not exactly what happened. In the case of the famous spy swap, the way that it worked and the way that they came about, Basically, the United States was saying, if Cuba doesn't liberate Alan Gross unilaterally and unconditionally, we're not going to do anything. And Cuba was telling the United States, well, if you don't liberate three of the five that still remain in jail, you know, the famous Cuban five in jail, no way that we're going to release uh, Alan Gross. Yes. Now, the interesting thing here is that Cuba did something that usually countries don't do which is released to the United States, a citizen of Cuba who had spied for the CIA betrayed Cuba. Now, to give you an idea of how significant that concession is, there is a case in the United States of a guy named Jonathan Pollard who spied for Israel in the 1980s. He was caught, he's in jail. The United States refuses to release Jonathan Pollard to Israel, even though Israel is a close ally of the United States. And the argument that the United States uses is that Jonathan Pollard was a U.S. citizen who spied against his country. Therefore, he was a place when, when Cuba obtained the release of the three, Cuba then released Alan Gross. I think that's creative. That's the second question is diplomatic relations. I invite you to examine every similar case Vietnam, China, diplomatic relations have been at the end of the process, never at the beginning of it. But Cuba had said on many occasions that unless the embargo was lifted, Cuba would not accept the establishment of diplomatic relations. Because, come on, 
How can you have normal diplomatic relations between two governments and one government embargo the other? So Cuba made an important concession, which is accepting the establishment of diplomatic relations without some of the big issues being solved. I, I would agree with Roberta Jacobson, who headed the American team, when she tried to explain to the, to the opponents of this policy in the Senate that it was not a concession of the United States to establish diplomatic relations. She said, an American embassy in Havana is not a gift to the Cuban government. <laughs> it reminded me a joke that Rafael Correa, the president of Ecuador, used to make made it recently, he said, why cannot, can there be no military coup in the United States? The answer, because there is no an American embassy in Washington. <laughs> <laughs> military coups happen in countries that have American embassies. <laughs> Let me speak a little bit about the challenge of normalization. In my view, in the view of many of us, there have never been normal relations between Cuba and the United States. Uh, the relationship has always been tainted by this, by the problem of asymmetry, by the fact that the United States has at times imposed on Cuba certain things. And the best example is the treaty for the base in Guantanamo. That treaty that was originally signed in 1911 and then renewed in 1934 has a peculiarity as a treaty where you lease a property to the other side. Would you, really, would you lease a property of yours to someone without no exit clause, no enters? You wouldn't. I know of a case in which the United States made it clear that it didn't want Cuba to do something, and Cuba said, yes, well, okay, that's reasonable. And it was the case of Edward Snowden. And those Snowden wanted to come to Cuba. And it seems that a Cuban diplomat went to see him and said, you know, Edward, we like what you're doing. Most of what you revealed, we knew. The rest we suspected. Uh, but you know, don't come to Cuba. We have enough in our plate to have another problem. Plus, <laughs> I don't like telling you, internet connection in Cuba is terrible. <laughs> Anyone who goes to Cuba knows that. It's obvious, I don't think that I have to explain that very much, that if he's going to make a deal, Obama is the better, the better, the better uh, candidate to make a deal. Because if Jeb Bush or Marco Rubio become president of the United States, that's going to be very difficult and we reach any kind of deal. So he's got the question of timing, which has to do with the two years that Obama has left in his term. But it is also his problem, because he has already announced that in 2018 he's going to retire. I agree with Professor Lou Perez of the University of North Carolina. He argues that the logic of history and geography make it inevitable that Cuba and the United States eventually would have an normal relationship. So it's better to start now with these points. President Obama is the first president of the United States who has said the embargo is a failure, we have to lift it. President Carter, who agreed, probably agreed with that, but he didn't say it publicly. President Clinton said it in private, but didn't say it publicly. Obama has taken the courage of saying, listen, this thing has failed, let's change it. Then he has started applying new regulations to travel, telecommunications, banking, trade, remittances, this is a very significant lifting of part of the environment. Of course, it will take a long time. President Obama cannot allow tourism to Cuba. That's expressly prohibited. But he can expand the licenses. He can expand the licenses for trade. And that would probably benefit the port of Mobile. One of the things that has changed is that Latin America and the Caribbean have become more and more autonomous, and that the United States has lost ground in the region. It has lost the initiative. In 1994, President Clinton launched the Summit of the Americas process, 
and proposed the FDAA. The FDAA went down the drain in 2006. And the process of the summits of the Americas that had taken place in Miami first, Santiago, this process was in crisis. And it was in crisis not only because the United States tended to be uh, not to, to pay attention to Latin America, especially during the Bush administration, but also because the countries of Latin America want to have their own, you know, make their own decisions. And in that process, Cuba has played the role. Last year, started with the summit of the community of Latin America and Caribbean countries in Cuba. Then the presidents of China and Russia visited Cuba. Then Raul Castro visited Brazil for to attend the summit of the BRICS country. The, the European Union restarted the process to normalize relations with Cuba. So Cuba is kind of in the middle of a process of change in, the, in, in a region like Latin America and the Caribbean that has, recognized by every specialist, the largest reserves of practically everything. Rainforest, water, oil, uh, mineral resources, and in large quantities. Something that the Chinese have come to realize. So much that they invited the select countries to participate in a forum with China uh, a move that was facilitated very much by Cuba, and there in Beijing, China offered five hundred billion dollars in aid and cooperation, financial cooperation, to the countries of the region. Are they doing that because they are nice? No, they're doing that because they know that there is importance in China. In terms of the political way of dealing with the problem, Obama faced a very difficult problem for the summit of the Americas in Panama in April this year, because at the summit of Cartagena uh, in 2012, well, probably what, what the media spoke more about the summit of Cartagena was the secret service scandal with the prostitutes in the hotel rooms. Well, but the big scandal in Cartagena was that the Latin American and Caribbean presidents told President Obama the next summit in Panama, Cuba must be there, because if Cuba is not there, we are not coming. At the summit of the Americas, Obama was facing the possibility that he had to go to the summit of the Americas in Panama and arrive there with everybody, you know, unhappy because he had not done anything about Cuba. Now probably he arrives in Panama and he's going to say, where is my pal Raul? I have to talk to him. <laughs> and probably Raul would say, well, I want to talk to Barack. There should be some things that we should be able to deal with. Let's, let's get together. Let's think. You know, it works. A few years ago, when the Salat was being founded, there was a conflict between uh, Chavez of Venezuela and Uribe of Colombia. And nobody was able to stop it. They, were, they almost went to blows. Suddenly, somebody banged on the table and said, Stop it, you're behaving like, ch like, like children. It was Raul Castro. He stopped the two presidents of their tracks. And they both, they finally did. Conference was a success, and everyone was very happy that Raul Castro was able to do it. So, we are starting a new process with the summit of with this summit of the Americas because Cuba and the United States will be sitting for the first time together in a multilateral, regional diplomatic process. We have several benefits. The first one is neighborliness. We're neighbors. Neighbors have to get along. Because anything that happens in the other side can hurt you. And they're, they're common threats. Hurricanes is a common threat. Drug trafficking is a common threat. Environmental degradation, the loss of marine life, is a common threat. We have the ability to work together, like Cuban and Americans are doing with the epidemic of Ebola in Africa. Normalization and establishment of the diplomatic relation means that we can start working on treaties and agreements. Uh, this idea, for example, of having a regatta, a race between Mobile and Havana, that's great. I will try to find out if we can we can do that. I hope.